Well, the exam's name is Security Plus. It's not something security or securing something. It's just security. That's it. And one pertinent question here would be, what exactly are we securing? Because we know we're talking about IT. So IT stands for Information Technology. And security applied to IT means that everything that we're basically securing is information or data. And that's exactly the answer to all IT security in the world. Everywhere we implement security in IT, what we're actually doing is securing data or information. And you might think here, well, Andrew, I know that, uh, for example, I'm using a VPN to connect to my work environment. And um, I know the VPN is a secure connection and I'm just using it to, to gain access to, the, to my company's network. How is that data security? Or another example, I'm using a credit card or Apple Pay or Google Pay or whatever to pay for something at a grocery store. And I know that the transaction is supposed to be secured. But again, where is the data? How, how exactly are we securing data in there? Is there really everything related to data security or not? And I would tell you that in both those examples, there's still data being involved. I mean, the VPN, you're using it to connect to your company network, but you're not connecting it just for the sake of the connection <laughs> to your company network, just to feel close to the office, but you're connecting because you need access to some data that is only accessible from within the company network. Maybe applications, internal applications, maybe databases, maybe even your own email mailbox that's only accessible from within the company. So at the end of the day, you're still protecting data. You're still securing data. Now on the credit card example, what's happening in there when that transaction goes through is that you're using some protocols and some security techniques to protect the data, the information that is being sent back and forth between you, the merchant and your bank right? Uh, we're protecting your, your credit card information so that it's not going to be spoofed or stolen by somebody who's, who might be performing fraudulent transactions. And we're also protecting the contents of that transaction itself because it pertains to your buyer profile, maybe your, your bank account or everything that's involved that identifies you as a person in there. So everywhere you look, it's going to be about securing data. It's going to be about securing information. And since we're talking about security information, well, let's think about this for a second. What's the first thing that comes into mind if somebody comes to you, a friend comes to you, gives you a piece of paper and tells you, well, that this right here is some very important and sensitive information. Make sure you secure it. What's the first thing that comes into your mind? Well, probably it's going to be to hide it somewhere, right? <laughs> so that it's not going to be visible for anybody who doesn't have any business knowing that information hiding that information, or I don't know, maybe memorizing it and destroying the paper, but that's just a quarter case, perhaps. The first thing that comes into mind for most people when we're talking about information security is about keeping that information secret. And that's exactly the first pillar, so to say, of IT security as well. That's confidentiality, making sure that only you have access to that information or only authorized people have access to that information and nobody else. Now, this in real life can be implemented in a number of ways. Just to mention two of them, uh, we have encryption, right? We are relying on the fact that we encrypt some information with some specific key. And if we are the only ones who know that key, then that information is safe because uh, whoever doesn't have the key has no way of accessing that information. Another way of uh, ensuring confidentiality is by using some sort of an access control system. That is a, just a simple web page, perhaps, that asks you for your username and a password. If you're accessing your email account, you're going to have to provide a username and a password and perhaps a, two, a second factor or authentication token in there. But again, this ensures confidentiality. This is a barrier that stops other people from accessing data in your email that you should consider private, right? It should be kept confidential. Next pillar of security is integrity. And this one is, is not, let's say, the most obvious one. Again, it's not the first thing that people think about when it comes to securing information because it addresses the fact that we need that information, even though it might be secured, it might be confidential. We need it to be reliable. 
we need to be able to consider that information true, not tampered with, in order to trust it. I mean, uh, let's let's just take an example here uh, that has nothing to do with confidentiality. You know, let's say you have an online store with uh, you're selling some products in there, and each product has a specific price. Now, is that information, the pricing information, is that confidential? No, of course not. Everybody can see the prices in there. But you probably need to trust that the database that stores those product prices hasn't been tampered with, or a normal user or a hacker doesn't get the opportunity to change the prices that of the products that they're, they're actually willing to buy. So those are going to be some, some methods in there which ensure that we have integrity for that specific piece of data. Now, luckily, this is an example where integrity has nothing to do with confidentiality, but luckily, confidentiality by itself also kind of ensures integrity as well. Because, well, if we think about encryption, for example, if, you, if you're the only one who knows the encryption or decryption key of a specific piece of data, then it's, it's also a way of ensuring integrity because a potential attacker has no way of altering or tampering with that data unless they actually know the key, right? So ensuring confidentiality sometimes, just sometimes, ensures integrity as well. And the third one is actually the least obvious one. It's the, the last one everybody thinks about when it comes to security, and that's availability. Availability means that the systems that store data, the systems that uh, ensure encryption and decryption, that ensure uh, authenticated access to that data, they're all working. It might be obvious, but <laughs> if you have a server that stores a bunch of information and it's encrypted, it's authenticated, it's checked for integrity, it's uh, protected behind 10 firewalls, and you lose internet connection to that server, <laughs> then that data is useless. Right? So availability, again, it's a very important aspect, even when it comes to security, because that data has to be available for you to be able to access it. All right. Uh, another example here would be, let's say that you have that piece of paper that we talked about in the very beginning, and uh, you, you, you lock the piece of paper in a safe, and you bury that safe 10 feet in the ground, and you pour some concrete over it. Is it secure? Yes. Is the, conf is, the, is the information in there confidential now? Yes, it is. Does it have integrity? Well, yes, because nobody can access it and nobody can change that information in there. Do you have availability? No, because not even you can access that information anymore. All right. So as you can see, there's, there's actually a triad here. There's a triangle. And you're going to see this uh, depicted in many trainings with the C, the I, and A, the CIA triad here. Because there's usually, when designing security, there's usually the need to develop a sweet spot, a perfect balance between integrity, confidentiality, and availability. Because you're, you, you cannot have all of them at the max at the same time. Right, and we're going to talk about this uh, also later on because in many situations, the more security you have, the more difficult it becomes to access that information, and the more frustrated the users are going to be, the users that actually need that information. And finally, there's a fourth pillar here, and again, this is not so obvious, but it's non-repudiation. Non-repudiation means uh, the inability of someone to deny having performed an action. Does this make any sense? <laughs> well, it's a bit harder to understand here uh, without going into some actual technical details and examples of real life implementations of this. But suffice to say that whenever people need to be held accountable, for example, people have sent an email, people have uh, encrypted some piece of information, has have sent some piece of information, uh, there are methods mathematical methods actually embedded in all the security technologies that allow us to confidently state the fact that only that specific person, only Andrew, was able to send that data or was able to generate that data. And Andrew has no way of denying it because Andrew probably is the only, um, is the only person who possesses the necessary keys or the necessary permissions to perform those actions. And that is non-repudiation. 
And when talking about the stages at which we can implement security, uh, we have uh, some starting points from NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which uh, defines security as five distinct functions. Uh, starting with uh, identification, identification of an incident where you just evaluate what threats you might be facing, you're developing some security policies, uh, you're thinking about what should be done in order to avoid a potential incident in the future. Followed by the actual protect phase, where you're developing security solutions, you're buying firewalls, you're configuring <laughs> IPSs in your network, making sure that the network is secure. The detection phase, where uh, this is more like an, uh, a constant monitoring operation, uh, where you're making sure that whatever happens in your network with your users, uh, in your network traffic, uh, is monitored, validated, and uh, potentially scanned for malicious intent. Uh, then follows the respond phase where you're actually facing an incident. So this is where you decide how will you act when a security incident actually happens, when a cyber attack happens. And we end with the recovery function, uh, which is a way of bringing back into compliance all the systems affected by a security incident. As you can see, these phases basically describe uh, the state of affairs before, during and after a security incident. All right, so how does exactly a security professional's job look like? What does what do they do? So this is, of course, is not an exhaustive list. This, these are not all the uh, potential tasks that a security analyst or an IT security specialist uh, would do on a daily basis, but we could at least pinpoint a couple of them. First of all, configure devices, configure security devices, develop security policies, implement those security policies, of course. Uh, then follows the uh, bit boring parts of the day where <laughs> you're simply monitoring events. It doesn't have to be boring. You can actually automate this on a lot of platforms uh, where uh, you actually have to decide what type of events or what exactly are you looking for, not just, you know, uh, digging through all that information through all those logs generating by, generated by your, uh, your your, uh, your devices. Uh, incident response, of course, this is the uh, unhappy or unfortunate days where an actual security incident happens. Of course, the security professional has to be the person, uh, the hands-on person uh, involved in a security incident response. Um, before reaching an incident, of course, this person should be responsible for planning as well. Uh, that is developing or at least advising when the security policies are being developed. And as a, let's say, subcategory of those security policies, we also have these access control and internal access policies. Uh, those are the things that most IT departments handle whenever uh, people come into the company or leave the company or go from one department to the next, uh, making sure that their permissions are adequate, they have access to the right applications and to the right networks, and they can actually do their daily jobs. And finally, of course, a security professional is going to be involved in risk assessments because a risk assessment, even though we have an entire chapter to talk about this, a risk assessment is very useful because it tells you where you are and where you should be. Ideally, it would also tell you what are the necessary steps that you should take in order to get from where you are to that ideal security posture that everybody is dreaming about. So it's about evaluating how much risk are we currently facing? What can we do? And what is a realistic expectation of minimizing that risk in the future? And realistic doesn't necessarily mean that it can be done. It has to be financially feasible as well. And well, since it all comes down to people for developing and implementing those security policies, we have some very specific job roles involved in uh, security functions. So we're starting with the CISO, that's the Chief Information Security Officer, the lead person responsible for security in an organization. Now, it might be that the department that the CISO belongs to is a, se a separate department in itself, concerned with security, or it might be as an uh, added appendix <laughs> to the IT department. Uh, now, there's also a lot of discussion here as to which one is better. Should security be its own department or should it be merged with IT? Because it, it basically, well, refers to information, right? Uh, 
and IT people are those who actually make sure that the information is accessible, available, and usable by all the uh, employees in a company. And this is actually the main problem here because uh, many people agree that the IT department in a company is focused so much more on availability, on making things work so that people don't complain, that security is very often an afterthought. It's implemented later on or not at all or just patched on uh, some existing solution. It's not designed from the ground up. So this is why some people think that it's better to have a separate department concerned with security rather than merging it with the IT department. And well, of course, to get things actually done, we need some technical staff in there. We need people to install devices, to monitor them, to configure them, and to ideally keep up to date with uh, current threats and current technologies uh, so that they know what to do when, uh, when they need to be proactive. And if we're facing a larger company where there's a lot of effort put into securing actual data or information or intellectual property, we might have a separate department uh, led by an information system security officer, an ISSO, which is only responsible for securing data. That is, in situations where the rest of the technical staff is more concerned with securing, let's say, network devices, servers, virtual machines, cloud environments, and so on, well, the information security officer is concerned with actual data, and it might not even be solely about digital data. It can also be about printed information as well. And don't forget that we also have non-technical staff involved in security. First of all, because well, the non-technical staff actually uses the systems that we're trying to, to protect. Those are the all, their, all the other employees in our company. Of course, they, they might not be technical staff. And also, we have non-technical staff in HR because they are involved in developing employee policies and security policies that apply to employees as well. And also, we have non-technical staff on the legal department because cybercrime might have legal implications and we need someone on the legal department to understand what's going on in there and just to wrap this up we also have some dedicated departments that might or might not exist depending on the profile of the company or how big the company is or how security concerned <laughs> the company is and we're going to find some uh let's say traditional business units or departments in a couple of companies here starting with the uh the department that deals with incident response and this one has a number of names. It could be a computer incident response team. It could be a computer security incident response team. Those are the people which might not even be solely assigned to that single job responsibility, but those are the people that are involved, that are gonna get a call when a security incident is detected, when a security incident happens, when an attack happens. And we could also have a security operations center or an SOC. Uh, which is a, let's say, a department that handles pretty much everything related to security. But in most cases, in most companies, and by the way, you're going to find this only in large companies or state-owned companies, uh, this is going to be a department that deals with monitoring, keeping an eye on potential threats, on external attacks, on, uh, on updates, on zero days, or exploits that have, uh, that have appeared from one day to the next. It's a lot of effort involved in here. It's a constant uh, work that never ends. <laughs> so, so it's a really big cost factor in maintaining an SOC. As we said before, don't forget that we also have the, or we had traditionally had the IT department to handle everything related to IT, including some security functions, right? Sometimes we don't even have a dedicated security department and IT is gonna handle everything. Uh, don't forget that IT nowadays and infrastructure that is managed by that IT department might be on premises as well as in public clouds. And finally, we have a department that is uh, it's a bit atypical, not so traditional as the other ones, uh, which stems from the DevOps movement, you know, the, the movement that tries to uh, befriend uh, both developers and sysadmins or operations people. This one happened 
or gained traction lately because uh, along with the development of automation tools, because uh, we can treat infrastructure now as code, we can uh, configure virtual devices using code, uh, we can do a lot of things in an automated manner, we can even configure security completely automated from a single uh, centralized point for an entire environment for an entire infrastructure. And all these all these developments have been merged into all these all these uh, technologies, all these tools have been merged under the DevOps umbrella. So it's automation in software development and automation in infrastructure uh, management. So DevSecOps is a natural evolution that tries to implement security on all stages of this automation pipeline starting from the very beginning when the software is developed from, from with the developers uh, ending with the uh, the deployment phase where the software or the code or the application actually runs on a dedicated infrastructure it might be virtualized it might be containers it might be somewhere in the cloud it might be on premises or no, in a client's data center it doesn't matter but nowadays we have the tools to automate this entire process from development to delivery or deployment so we'd better make sure sure that we don't forget about security somewhere in between. So DevSecOps is basically security embedded at every stage in the development pipeline and also in the deployment phases uh, that ensure that the end product reaches the hands of its users. Is this a separate department? Probably no, but it involves people from both development and IT operations. And it requires both of them to be aware of each other and also to be aware of the security implications that they, they might be facing. All right, that's it about information security and roles. I told you that we're not going to be wasting any more time. So that's it for now. See you on the next video. If you like this, share a comment in the comment section, like and subscribe and see you next time.